shall we actually begin? <laughs> what are we going to do? I think we should start with, shall we actually begin? Have we begun already? I think we have. Okay, good. Very good. <laughs> oh, man, that's going to be just a total riot. This is PodKit, episode 40, Watch Out for Pros, on Sunday, July 29th, 2018. And now, a freezer in your firmware. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Ramperset. <laughs> this episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk40. Hey, guess what? For the first time in probably over a year, we have some follow-up. hey So you remember how in episode 38, whenever, what was that, a month ago? Two? Something? Uh, I don't know. Too long ago? Yeah. We uh, proposed a jingle submission for new Twitter followees. And well, in, in typical fashion, the only participant was our, our favorite fan, Ian Arbuck. Hey, Ian. Precisely. Hey, Ian. So uh, we will now play that clip for you right now. Hey there, podkitters. I hear that you're looking for a little jingle for your uh, new Twitter followees segment. Uh, I got something for you here. It's just, uh, you know, kind of off the top of my head. Starts a little something like this. <laughs> the laugh gets me every time. Yeah, that's the best part. Very genuine. I, maybe that should just be the title, just Ian's laugh. <laughs> See, so yeah, I think you could. I think you could make that work. Um, yeah, but that would mean someone would have to edit the show. Well, we know that nobody edits the show. It right. just edits itself. I guess so. That laugh is just inserted somehow every time. Every time in the nope. correct spot. That's how that's how it works. Uh, but I guess you know, suffice it to say, I think it's pretty unanimous that that is going to be our new Twitter followers jingles jingle, right? Yeah, we're gonna until do it. something better is received. Yes, right. <laughs> it's See, like it's like a stack. I don't I don't know if that's possible. I think this is always going to remain uh, number one. Well, in, uh, so 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 it could be a, a, a like a mashup. So when when a better musical portion comes along, we can use that, but we can still keep the laugh at the end. Sounds good to me. That sounds like a challenge. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe we'll have something by the end of the year at this point, right? Yeah, yeah maybe so. Maybe. Sounds like fun. All right. So, since last episode, some great new things have been released from Apple. So I want to put last episode into context. We talked about how there was no hardware at our favorite uh, Apple-related event, WWDC. Rip. Uh, rip indeed. And... and um. It turns out something did happen related to what we always wanted, new computers. Just Woo-hoo. took them off. <laughs> so what, are, what, what kind of new computers, Brian? They are 2018 uh, MacBook Pros, so new See, 13 and 15 Even Brian had ones. to think about what kind of computer these were. He wasn't sure. Well, and you, have to, you almost have to be more specific than that, right? Because they didn't refresh all the MacBook Pros. No, in fact, they retired some of the MacBook Pros. They retired Ooh. possibly the best MacBook Pro ever designed. Oh. Not, is... not in today's age, though. That's true. Especially That's compared true. to these, if I can I think have that, that opinion. I think that is an opinion and an arguable opinion at best. Yeah, it's fair. Watch out um, for pros. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, so so there's no there's no more of the uh, of the original MacBook Pro design, if you can call it that, the original unibody MacBook Pro design, um, from 2015 to now, I guess, basically was when that happened, right? Um, no, I, I don't know when it started, but 2015 was the last model. I think uh, the new ones were 2016. Yeah, 2016 okay. is from the new casing. Um. Except so what the makes 2015 12-inch these... MacBook was 2015. 
Uh-huh. So, so, so what, what, starting... what makes the new ones new? Basically new processors. New processors. Mm-hmm. Finally, they're on the, uh, is it Coffee Lake? They're on the Coffee Lake train, which is nice. I think that's Coffee, yeah, 8th gen. So still the 14 nanometer process on the, as um, what Marco says, tick tock, 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 tock. Yeah, um, that seems fair. Yeah. Um, so the the big difference for th- with this generation is that they double, or no, they added two cores to every computer. So the 13 inches can now go up to four core processors. And the 15 inches can go up to six core processors. So I want to make a point about that. So Apple has nothing to do with that. That's something that Intel did um, with their own SKUs. So it's not like Apple said, like, hey, I want more processors because our pros want them. Intel actually was able to do it. So these are fast. There's, you know, for multi-threaded applications like compiling code or rendering video or something audio work when it's somehow multi-threaded somehow you can uh do it much faster and they even have intel released the i9 cpu which is really just you know the i7 with faster clock rates exactly and i think it's unlocked actually too yes it is so it's it's interesting that the um so there's there's you know how there's all, usually two configurations there's kind of like a base config and then you can customize stuff um for each of the two sizes of the computers so the um 13 inch macbook pros have um i5s in them which but they're four core i5s which is unusual uh given the last 10 years of the core i line and then the new 15 inch macbook pros all of the i7s um like all of the options are six cores there's an i7 and an i9 and as brian mentioned the i9 is kind of just unlocked and overclocked ready for you um so it's pretty cool this is true um but i guess or is it cool right one of the other things uh that pretty quickly came out about these uh uh about particularly the new i9 but i believe it also affected other models is that it affected all of them i think so Ooh. I didn't hear that it affected, and nobody's ever talked about the base model i7 15 inch, which is bizarre. I don't understand. Right. Yeah. Right. So the issue was that some f- firmware in the voltage regulator chip or something wasn't configured quite correctly, and so it resulted in under high thermal loads, the processors stepping down to their lowest clock frequencies, which in this case was 800 megahertz way more aggressively than they really should. So it meant that performance was pretty reduced. It was still a lot better than previous generations because of the extra cores, but they weren't as as good. So Apple released a software update maybe a week after these came out, and there had been some YouTube videos and discussions, um, even a Reddit post saying or proposing that there is a, a bug in one of these chips. Mm-hmm. Um, but it fixed it all up performance was improved and i think most of the macbooks especially the i9 because that got the hottest but apple did say it it affected all of the new macbook Mm -hmm. pros yeah i guess like the thing that stuck out about me with uh stuck out to me about this whole incident is um there was like a youtube video where a reviewer um ran uh a benchmark once just with his laptop uh, with an i9 processor sitting on the table and the next time he ran it uh, with the i9 in the freezer, <laughs> uh, and the performance difference was pretty, uh, you know, it, it was it was pretty entertaining, right? Yes. And um, then after the fix, he ran it again on the table, and it was the same as if it were in the freezer and a little bit better. Yeah, which is so, pretty awesome. That's good. Yeah. A software update that fixes it all. Hooray. Yep. A freezer in your firmware. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So the the pricing for these uh, MacBook Pros um, unfortunately remains the same as last year, uh, which is kind of a bummer in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I'm still paying that four hundred dollar premium for MacBook Pro with a Touch Bar that I didn't really want and that right. doesn't really help me too much. But you need it because of what else? What other opportunities it opens up to you? Yeah. Which aren't many. Right. Um, the keyboard is slightly adjusted this year mm-hmm. um so they have a new membrane kind of thing that sits under each key cap and it's allegedly there to reduce noise but re- what it's really there for is to you know help keep the crumbs and dog hair out 
This is true. That said, a, you know, dogs love computers as much as anyone else. So, I agree. <laughs> um, it's it's good to see Apple finally recognizing that public. Yeah. Well, I mean, if it's not dogs, it's cats. But you know, any any kind of fur or extra hair. Mm-hmm. Um, the screen didn't change, but they added the capability for the screen to uh, see. I everybody true tone ta- display. Everybody talked about the screen changing to have mm-hmm. true tone display. The screen didn't change. All it did, all it does now, is the camera samples the ambient light temperatures. And is it the camera? I thought it was just a new sensor. That it's a new sensor, but it's really the camera. Right. It's still a. It's still a camera. The screen didn't change, but everybody says the screen changed. So so it's it's a lovely feature. Good good work, Apple. Cool. Here's the problem. Everybody who covered this, you know, in the first three weeks of launch time, uh-huh. just I I don't know if anybody is capable of reporting technology stuff anymore. Why do you say that? So so like the i nine thing is was one thing. Yeah. But but nobody no, the screen didn't change. Nothing changed about it. I don't know. Like I I'm just so I'm so tired of uh, what goes on these days. Right, right, right. That's kind of regurgitation as opposed to actual analysis of what this feature really is, if you can even call it that. But not even just that one feature, but even the whole the whole release. Right, right. There was I'm... there was one other uh, feature here that was good, um, and that is that you can customize your your 15 inch MacBook Pro to actually have some uh, some RAM. You can now have 32 tabs open in chrome with 32 gigabytes of backing uh backing ram so or or up to perhaps about uh 12 electron apps <laughs> up to but not including not not including yeah. yeah and this was a change on the apple side so the previous generation did support ddr4 ram but apple only used the lp ddr3 because it uses less power yeah but they and... allowed you to configure to use true 32 gigabytes of ddr4 ram Mm -hmm. well let's look so like let's see this is coffee lake right coffee lake i don't know arc cool uh well so what i was thinking is what if coffee lake doesn't support ddr3 at all Mm -hmm. so maybe they had no choice if they wanted to move on i think it does so looking at the specs the 13 inch with touch bar only supports the 8 or 16 gigs of lp ddr3 and the 15 inch only has the ddr4 Mm. I could do it. It does look like there are certain desktop uh, logic boards that do support DDR3 um, with Coffee Lake, but it seems like, you know, based on the number of ports I'm seeing that have like triple question marks and saying, can I use DDR3 with a Coffee Lake processor? It looks like it's not extraordinarily common. Um, and why would it be? I have DDR4 in my desktop, uh, and it's pretty great. Like, it was pretty pedestrian to get DDR4 even two years ago when I was building this. I'm looking at the um, Intel Arc website, mm-hmm. and apparently there's an i5 with six cores even. How does this? E- how is this even possible? Like, their naming convention has gone... Yeah, totally out the window. Because, totally... like, the, the i5 used to be the same number of cores as the i7, but without hyper-threading. And the i3 was just smaller, lower... With, well, no, the i3 was fewer cores but with hyper threading right and now, now there's an i5 8800 8500 up to 4.1 gigahertz this is obviously a desktop chip it includes optane memory somehow um and it's been launched since um q2 18 apparently and it can have six cores in it i don't i don't understand intel yeah they're i think they're kind of scrambling to make it look like stuff's improving cuz they're still not at 10 nanometer. Yeah. But that's coming what end of 2019 I've heard now allegedly. Mm. And it kind of goes back to that discussion we had a couple episodes ago about Moore's law and how like at a certain point we we've reached the point where like incrementally improving process size isn't really uh as feasible as it once was at least with the way that we manufacture boards nowadays. Yeah. But... So I was just reading this. Mm-hmm. Apparently there's another reprocess refinement, which will be the third Skylake process refinement following Cabby Lake and Coffee Lake. This will ship 
um, in the second half of 2018, and it is named Whiskey Lake. Nice. <laughs> These... What what uh, improvements are they adding? Uh, this Wikipedia page does not say much. I will put it here in the show notes for everyone to enjoy Intel's lack of enthusiasm. See, I have to say, though, um, these last two lakes have been sounding pretty delicious, um, which is improvement over the past two lakes, if nothing else. So, can you can you I'm eat right a, can you eat or drink a cabbie? I don't know what a cabbie is. See, I don't know either, which is why uh, I think I, I would prefer coffee and whiskey uh, lakes than lakes of whatever cabbie is. <laughs> okay. Um, speaking of new computers, um, I received a new computer. Hey, hey, Ooh, shiny. Um, but but um, so one of the things in the technology um, consumer electronics department that I've learned is that when um, a normal person says new, uh, they assume that it's new, like it's the new one. Like, of course, it's the new one, obviously. But when they get sold something listed as new, it might be new in the box, but not like the latest, newest one. Right. Um. So I received a new MacBook Pro 2017 model. Hmm. And that's that's when you're supposed to play the fiddle sound or something. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah. There, that that was good. Like like that was the soundboard just on demand. Sad sad trombone. Yeah. Brandon is our soundboard. I I'm, guess I'm so. A, I'm a regular old uh uh is it Paul Newman? No. Andy Newman? Who's the who's the Foley artist guy? Foley Foley artist guy dot com. <laughs> no, no, no. Fred Newman. There we go. I had to go through all the all the Newmans. Fred Newman. Yes, I'm I'm a regular Fred Newman. Yeah, so I, I have this new um this new MacBook Pro. I'm not using it right now today because it's at work right now. Um But I but I realized coming down here to do this podcast today yeah. that had I had it and I was trying to use it, I would have had to go find which I don't have, so it wouldn't have worked. I would have had to somehow figure out how to attach this USB A adapter to the um, Snowball Yeti, whatever this thing is, mm-hmm. uh, microphone. Somehow get it into the computer because, man, adapter lifestyle is awful. I Just you. get one huge docking station. I have the El- El- Elgato Thunderbolt three dock at work, and it works. See, it has problem... lots of ports. The problem with that that theory is computers are supposed to, I mean, laptop computers are supposed to be on the go, mobile computers. Mm-hmm. And so I shouldn't have to carry a dozen dongles with me no matter where I go. Right. Or docks. Yeah, that's true. I guess at, at work, I mostly have my computer at my desk and monitors and everything plugged in. Or yeah. I'm on the go in a meeting and I don't need anything. So right. that's, it fits my use case, at least. I'm kind of right in the middle. Like, I do need stuff. So in the office, for sure, like, I'm going to, I'm going to unfortunately, feel the pain of never having a dongle at the uh, meeting table or meeting room for HDMI. Like, I know that's going to happen. Right. And so I asked, like, can we just, like, order a bunch for each room and just tie them down? And they're like, yeah, we tried that once. Didn't work. Hmm. They cut People cut them out of the room. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do have an, an adapter that goes from USB-C to, I think, or I guess from four different ports to USB-C in there, like uh, D-Sub or VGA, HDMI, yep. uh, mini display port, and I think there's one more, but it's not display port. Um, maybe it's a DVI, actually. I could be wrong, though. Yeah. So, anyway, so in conjunction with all of the reviewers reviewing the um, 2018 computers, and then me receiving a 2017 computer, um, and all the reviewers saying, you know, it would have been better if Apple just hadn't actually changed it from the 2015, you know, previous generation style. Right. I pretty much mostly agree. The trackpad's way too big for no real reason. The keys aren't really better. Nothing's better. It is nice that it's a little thinner and lighter, but I don't care. Um, I, I think the the bezels on the new ones are a little smaller. True. I agree. Um, the displays are better. Not that they couldn't have put that in the old design. I don't mind the new keyboard so much. Um, it's. I wish it was a little more like the Magic Keyboard 2. Just a touch more travel, but I... 
I use that one constantly at work at least. And I've really liked that one. Um, it's kind of in between. Um, but I don't know. That's the way forward. I do like having a ton of Thunderbolt 3 ports if you use Thunderbolt 3 because I can just kind of plug it in wherever and it works. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know. That's something we'll never really know. I think I do. So I'm looking at my 2012 MacBook Pro, which is the same design as they had through 2015. Yep. And it just seems kind of big and bulky, at least compared to my 13-inch 2017 MacBook Pro. Oh sure. well, you got to compare size to size, though. Like that's not cha- yeah. That's not so. Fair. I know, I know that's a, a factor of it, but I don't know. Uh, on the other hand, I would so so Marco on the um, wonderful ATP podcast yeah. that we all listen to. Um, you know, he he was highly recommended. Every, everybody that uh, can can get a new MacBook Pro, you should totally try to get the uh, 2013. I mean the 20 or 13 inch. 2018 macbook pro because it has the power of a 15 now effectively with its four cores right i don't know if i could ever use a laptop that small like that's just it's really nice for being portable because it's a little lighter i don't need to be portable i need a computer yeah and that goes into my do i buy a macbook pro and a big old 5k display or an imac and i'm still not sure but i'm waiting for imacs now then i'll decide See, the problem with the iMac for me is that it has the same internal guts as a MacBook Pro, so why bother? No, they use desktop CPUs. Yeah, it's a, that's not really true. It's more of a maybe they do, but mostly they don't kind of thing. I know at least the Haswell era, so the 2014 Mac, iMac had like the 4790K. Yeah, like, they do use desktop parts, um, but they don't have desktop cooling, which sort of makes you wonder. I... I think the iMac's do for a design update, even though they just put out the iMac Pro. Yeah. Well, a year ago with. I the expect old them to case, align but... more with that. Yeah, and I think that comes with not having a hard drive in it. Mm-hmm. And that's how they have the extra room for cooling in the iMac Pro. And I'm hoping they do that with the iMac because I want one. Yeah. <laughs> and I want it to be cool. Mm-hmm. Cool, not hot, not like the i9. Cool, not hot. Nope. This is true. So, Brandon, I heard that you also have some new products. Yes, new indeed. But this is neither new in the sense that these are the most recent model of those products, nor that they are new in box. Um, I, new to you. New to me. Yeah, exactly. So I got some uh, extremely lightly used uh, computers recently because a friend was selling them. Um, uh, it's uh, basically a, a 2013 MacBook Pro which is, uh, you know, kind of old. It just so happens to be the exact same year and model as the one that I use at work, exact same specs and everything, um, which made it really easy to make this all of a sudden just like a personal iOS development machine, which is great. Um, And because it was lightly used, it was extraordinarily cheap, um, which is super helpful. It's also the first laptop I put stickers on, which is fun. Um, Yeah, I know, right? There's a Nexus sticker on it, even though it's pointing the wrong way. Um, so it goes, uh, and I also got a 2014 Mac mini, um, which is, happens to be the only, uh, Mac mini, the most recent Mac mini, um, that has, uh, no user serviceable parts. You can't swap out the Ram. Uh, and if you want to swap out the drive, you have to first go through, uh, and remove the logic board, remove every, every darn part of the thing. That's ridiculous. There's nothing for it. Yep. But it does make a little, a uh, nice little digital ocean node, but in your house sort of uh, situation here. So it's like a Mac Mini Colo, but in your house. Exactly. We've exactly. full circle. Uh, it's co-located with nothing else. It's just, well, it's co-located with the rest of my computers, which is kind of nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like a server that's remote, but local. Yep, exactly, exactly. <laughs> which is um, called a computer. Yep. <laughs> or yep. a home server. Yeah. No, it's, it's pretty awesome, though. So I, I have it set up such that I can... Um, use it as an Xcode server, um, which Ooh. is not extraordinarily necessary. And, pe- you know, uh, long-time listeners to PodKit and folks who know me IRL will know that I'm a pretty big fan of CI and CD in no small part because it can, uh, A, it makes builds repeatable, and B, it removes the need to um, build for release locally, which is like the number one cause in my mind of ridiculous dumb mistakes. Yep. Um, Never do that, ever. 
Exactly, exactly. Um, so uh, one thing that I like about having this Mac Mini set up as an Xcode server is that when I'm doing personal stuff, like for fun iOS development or um, ra random things, I can just kind of uh, offload that build work onto this Xcode server that's hanging out here that I still have essentially a full, you know, uh, what's the phrase, like, like line rate, um, like speed connection to. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't have to worry about going over anyone else's network. It's just um, local here, so it works. Um, super speedy. Um, and yeah, it's, it's as, as far as the uh, actual hardware on the machine goes, it's not that fast as far as things go. The MacBook's definitely faster. Um, it's nice to have something that can just kind of uh, offload some of that stuff too. Uh, Chug along in another room. Exactly. And it was all like super cheap. We're talking like, yeah, it doesn't even matter how much it was, but it was super cheap, <laughs> which is uh, all made possible because uh, my buddy was getting rid of some stuff. So, so you're you're lucky. The day after you bought it, that Apple didn't release new products. You're you're lucky. Right. There there was at least two days uh, there, <laughs> uh, and, but it was it was before that that went out. So I was like, oh man. But hey, it was like fully what one sixth of what uh the MacBook Pro 2018 that I would oh, want would have cost. Yeah, of course. So I uh I guess in that sense I made like a bandit. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Cool, cool. Well, uh while I'm saying words, uh I want to talk about Redux. We don't talk about Redux here enough. We don't, uh, but we are now. Um and the reason for it is uh the There's, reason for Redux. The reason for Redux is, uh, uh oh, huh. uh, yeah, T too many, too many layers, um, too much middleware? Question mark. <laughs> uh, is uh, I've been digging into the the history and like the origin of this thing called the Saga pattern. So if you've used Redux Saga or other Redux uh, middleware like uh, like Redux Thunk or uh, Redux Observable, yeah. Um, yeah, 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 like Brian, Brian likes Redux Observable. Um, I, I, I kind of wanted to know a little bit more about where these weird terms come from because, like, I'm familiar with, um, with uh, Observable, like, uh, and its ties to like uh, RxJS and other like streams. Exactly, other like Rx libraries um, in other languages. Um, but like Saga and Thunk always felt like two terms that seemed kind of odd, uh, odd, yeah, odd and arbitrary. Thunk. And it was just like some React Illuminati person being like, "I'm gonna call this the Saga because yes, I like whose the name word is Dan. Saga." Whose name is uh, yeah, Dan or Ryan or something like that. Yeah, uh, take your pick, really. Um, yep. Uh, but it turns out. Um, hilariously something that is not mentioned in the documentation for redux thump nor redux saga is that both of these terms actually have like 50 year histories well um, for thunk actually they do have the wikipedia link now oh really oh, that's yeah, good for, for thunk i'm glad they added it when yeah. i last when i last looked i could have swore it wasn't there but i've you know stranger things have happened than me mistaking that um but with redux saga the interesting thing is they never talk about the origin or what it means to write a saga. Um, now, there's a paper that I'll link in the show notes that goes into great detail about this from like the 70s or 50s or something like that, one of those time periods that I wasn't around for. Um, but basically, a saga is just a pattern for doing any sort of long-lived transaction, something that might require multiple requests to external systems, and um, a failure in, certain, in some situation might cause you to have to undo a bunch of stuff. Uh, and the best metaphor I can think of or the most succinct is like if you do a database transaction, right? If you do a database transaction, you're going to say, all right, I'm going to make these changes to the database, but if any of them fail, I need to roll everything back. Um, so the interesting thing is, of course, um, Saga middleware doesn't really give you that for free. You have to write your code in a way that, that takes advantage of this. Um, and I fear that most people who use Redux Saga don't know that and aren't writing that because there are definitely sagas that I've written that were not like that, which is kind of upsetting. Um, but I've gone back and fixed most of those now, so that's cool. Um, I guess the the point of this rant is just, hey, sometimes there are historical underpinnings for how we do things, and the React ecosystem does a really poor job 
of making uh making that clear so uh read up pals <laughs> i guess that's that anywho speaking of uh surfer side stuff yeah who's working with next js <laughs> uh, yeah so uh i am nice um so nest js is something that i linked to both of you to probably i don't know six, six or eight months ago when i just yeah. happened to stumble upon it yeah. um but i wasn't using stumble upon i <laughs> throwback um, yeah it's a throwback isn't it um so you might know that i am not a node developer i i am firmly in the camp that you should use php for everything uh-huh. um right is that is that true i have to that's go look fair. it up to know if that's uh... true or not I might beg to differ, but yeah, <laughs> you're right. I agree. So, um, Node is not my favorite backend platform. I like JavaScript on the front end, but I don't, I don't, I don't value Node at all on the back end. It's just a mess, and nobody understands why it's a mess until they understand why it's a mess. Um, so. Um, I'm working with um, a Java developer, and um, for the past few projects, we've been um, basically forced into using some type of JavaScript node thing on the back end. First it was Lambda, then it was Express uh, in a Lambda, and then it was just Express on a Beanstalk. And and now we can we, we actually get to put um, ex- whatever we want in a Docker container, and it can be wherever it goes. Um, so different different infrastructures, but and so, some sort of different architectures. Um, and for this iteration of project time, we wanted to try something different. So instead of a Lambda that has an API gateway, instead of an Express that does whatever it does, um, and which is just plain JavaScript and then maybe having something like SQLize, we wanted to try TypeScript on the server. Woot. So, so as you might have heard, TypeScript um, is uh, good friends with something called Angular. Um, and it's almost it's one of those things that's um, one of those enterprise um, libraries, I think. Yeah, something like uh, that. You, you know, like all 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 of the people who just make stuff for fun on the weekend use React, and Angular is the is is the thing for enterprise code. Oh no! Um, sure. <laughs> and and um, you know, it uses TypeScript, which I think is really valuable because it allows you to have types. You get to actually know what your models are. You know, you get to have um type completion in your ide um there's a lot of advantages to having this now there are some huge disadvantages um and it usually comes down to how quickly you need to be able to iterate early on and then how quickly you need to do maintenance later on i think that's kind of what the spectrum ends up being so I, I think TypeScript is really good um and you know there's a learning curve but i think it's just something that you get used to over time so doing it on the server side, which is where I have most of my problems with JavaScript, um, that looked appealing. So I tried Nest.js. So Nest.js is kind of um, kind of springy, if you've ever used Spring. It's also sort of Angularly, if you've ever used Angular. Um, you know, it kind of fits that um, Java X Java developer mindset. Right. Um, so it has controllers. It has services. It has modules. It, it of course it has um, some more JavaScript centric things like middleware and and pipes and guards and interceptors and you know really none of this is JavaScript centric, but you know what I mean. Big OOP stuff. Yeah, which is sort of what TypeScript thrives on, and uh, all the ex Java developers also thrive on. Well, so I've been using it for a couple of weeks now, um, and it's cool. But the documentation here on this website is pretty mostly lacking. Yeah. Um, so, for example, if you go to the provider section, you'll you'll be um, taught about services. So, what a, what a service class is and how to use it, how to get it to do cool stuff. But unfortunately, it's all about cats. It's not about like cars or farms or I don't know trucks. Yeah, not really an applicable metaphor. It's cats. Hmm. I love pushing cats into an array, but it's not very realistic for what I do day to day. Um, so I guess um, that's cool. Nest.js is cool. Um, I've basically concluded that it still didn't actually help me write code in Node on the server side. It's 
another thing that's extremely brittle and it doesn't actually work. Um, so let's go on to the next thing. Type ORM. So type ORM. So this is a ORM that is based in TypeScript. It, it, it itself is in TypeScript, but it also forces you to use TypeScript. Um, and it looks really similar to the um, Entity Framework or um, Spring JPA model of defining entities, working with a connection manager, working with repository pattern. All super cool stuff. Um, here's what I've also learned again. When you code something in Node, it is my opinion that it should be something you should be able to replace within a week of work. Right. Like, if the thing you're making isn't that small, you shouldn't be using Node, maybe. Um, because it just gets to be a spaghetti pile of how does this even work? Right. Um, and TypeScript kind of helps. Um, so you get to know, like, oh, look, it's an int. Oh, look, it's a string. I bet uh I bet I bet username is always a string though. So, I don't know how much it really helps. Yep. Um so to, so so recently I've been trying to use type ORM and there's some really cool stuff in here. So like there's this concept of of embedded entities. So everybody knows inheritance. So, yeah. you could inherit from a base class and then uh, maybe um you have your create a date, create date and update date in your base class and then all of your other models can extend from there that sounds pretty cool and lets you reuse code in a kind of a nice efficient way well what if you don't have a common base class with all your things what if you want some of the things to have you know this this meta these met metadata columns but other things to have different metadata columns well embedded entities let you do that it lets you do composition instead of inheritance which i think is wonderful uh -huh. This sounds great in theory, but here's the problem. They don't let you customize the name of the column that gets generated. It generates the name of the column, which is awful. So yeah. instead of um so their example here is you you name your embedded entity name, and then the entity itself has first and last. So then in theory you would get like name dot first and name dot last or or maybe you could even just describe it yourself. It would just be first name, last name. Nope, it's name first and name last. <laughs> nope, nope, this is just awful. Right. Um, and there are just other weird gotyas in in um, type ORM like this. So I've been trying to use save in the repository. And so save is supposed to insert if it doesn't exist or update if it does exist already. Should be simple. Doesn't work. Oh no. So I've I've opened a couple of tickets and a couple of Stack Overflow threads and we'll see if anything ever comes of this. But at this point in my product development cycle, I am pretty close to putting this all away and go finding um some Spring and some Java to get it done. How about this, you make your own library, Ryan? I don't have um <laughs> time. Uh it just it doesn't work. And my my own library exists. It's called PHP. Yeah, that, yeah, I saw mm -hmm. that coming. <laughs> <laughs> I get you. Yeah, so so I I think it's um I think it's really interesting when um so like I've been doing JavaScript stuff for a long time. Yeah. Um, my partner who's not a JavaScript person, they're they're a Java developer. Um, it's really interesting to see what his opinion on this kind of stuff is because, you know, the the Java perspective on a lot of this has been established in the industry for the last 20 years right. whereas in php we've only really established a pattern for doing things you know in the last i don't know five to six so it's kind of fun truly even if it doesn't work it's still kind of fun yeah yeah no it's interesting to hear about this occasionally i see somebody throw around a link to nest.js and it's 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 uh really good to hear your take on that because it's always so, kind of been my feeling as well when you when you when you um see somebody sending a link to that um yeah. let's see like let me uh let me let me look there's a really good um alternative that i've been thinking about using um i'll put it in the show notes right here <laughs> oh yeah you know i've heard of this before can what is the name of that brandon uh how do you pronounce it uh i think it's is it ruby Ru ruby ruby, Ru ruby, ruby right. on Ruby on Rails? Yeah. Not oh, yeah. Rails, Rails, yeah. Ruby on Rails. Yeah. Ruby on Rails. I think so it turns out Ruby on Rails actually could get everything you wanted and more done in three quarters of the time. 
You know, it's funny you mention that. Um, I'm actually a Ruby on Rails developer from time oh. to time. The only thing you won't have is types, but uh, apparently you didn't need those in the first place. Right. See, so it's funny you mentioned that because the thing, the thing that I looked at as soon as I look at the Nest.js um, documentation on controllers yeah. is all of these, um, uh, what would you call it? The, the at statements. Oh, it's annotations. Not a pragma, annotations, yeah. All of the annotations, immediately I see that as like why I would just use Ruby for this. Right. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, let's get so rid of, yeah. I mean, like the the annotations is one thing. Yeah. Um, there are more functional ways to represent that kind of stuff or yeah. other methods, but the 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 dream is to have a strongly typed backend language. Right. Um. Okay. So I guess I could link to Phoenix, but that doesn't really help anybody. Right. 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 Or yeah. Do we need a TypeScript on Rails? <laughs> well, what, no, what would that be? It would be. Um, It'd be I think, like I th- everything Ruby on Rails is, but I think we have that. It's called Nest.js. It just doesn't work, right? Yeah, I suppose. It, it's all JavaScript's fault, as far as I can tell. I yeah. mean, Node's fault. Sorry. It's an ecosystem I... that will be changing very rapidly. I think maybe we'll, Don't worry, we'll yeah. maybe eventually get one framework that will be standard, other than Express. We'll yeah. see. But... Express is not a framework. Don't let anybody fool you. Right. That's a topic for another a day. library. <laughs> so, something that builds on Express. There's another library here that I could talk about, but we'll save it for next time. Nice. Look at that suspense. Dun, yeah. dun, dun. So I guess that means it's time for our new Twitter followees. Hit it, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So good. Okay, you have Very to start, nice. Brandon. All right, so I, uh, because this has been such a short time between episodes, relatively speaking, I've only followed two people. 200? Two million people. Oh, wow. Wow. oh okay. That's more realistic. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Uh, the first one that I wanted to talk about here today is uh, NEJSConf, uh, which is the uh, conference for JavaScript in Omaha, Nebraska. I've seen some really cool stuff coming out of there, um, and I think it's happening, or it happened a couple days ago, which probably explains why I followed them, because it happened a couple days ago. Um, But they had a bunch of really awesome talks around the business of JavaScript and stuff like that, Um, or when I say the business of JavaScript, like, um, there's this one talk that really stuck out to me about, like, millennial JavaScript and explaining JS uh, concepts through, like, jokes about millennials, which I am always here for. (laughs) it's it just looks like a really fun awesome conference and i kind of want to go to it next year even though i have no conceivable way of getting to nebraska um and that's twitter follow number one for me twitter follow number two uh ryan you're gonna like this one uh it's an agency based in london and essex called sweet um and they build bespoke high quality websites according to their twitter bio uh and uh, they they seem to be PHP and Laravel fi- fans. Yay! Which is, there you go, which is kind of why I followed them. Uh, they also seem to like tennis, which is cool. Um, tennis is fun. People like tennis from time to time. Uh, and they seem like cool folks. Uh, and that does it for me. How about nice. you, Brian? Uh, I haven't really followed anyone except uh, Pendulum. I think I used to follow them. They're a, a uh, drone base electronic alternative band from uh australia i think anyway two of the three people make up the duo knife party i saw them at in minneapolis a few weeks ago and the other one is a more of dj who will be playing also at minneapolis in august a dj set of their music and i've been listening to them for many many years so i'm very excited to see it nice i followed one person I followed a person that I, um, uh, I don't know, somebody must have retweeted this and it was in my timeline. It was, um, somehow he made a visualization of, um, internet speeds around the world. And then I asked for a visualization of internet speeds relative to the population of that area. Um, and so this guy is Peter Levels. Peter, I think that's how you would say it. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of cool, and, and so I guess he makes maps somehow or something. I don't know what he does, but somehow we made a visualization with a map, and it was cool. Yeah, those are pretty cool. He has one later in his timeline, internet or from earlier today, internet speed versus murder rate. 
<laughs> yeah, I gotta watch out for that. Uh oh. Yep. Huh. What well, what does it look like? How is the correlation? Um a lot of Central and South America are high on murder and low on internet. Yeah. Here, I'll just um plug it into the show notes and we all can take a look. Yeah, it's it's dangerous to live where there's no internet. Definitely. Although the US isn't doing too well there either, I guess. Right. Yeah, that's that's true. Kind of a mix of the both. This is true. Well, that was a fun episode. It was. So much fun. Nice and expeditious too. So so, so what what are you guys doing in the next uh I don't know. I don't want to say next for next week because you never know what could happen. What are you doing for the next month or so? <sighs> Let's see. Uh so this... As you might know, it'll be August yeah. soon. Which uh, means it's time for me to uh, go to the state fair. Nice. Um, Ooh, yes. You can find me uh, probably at the Minnesota Public Radio booth, which is where I always hang out at the state fair because it's where the radio is. That's cool. Um, beyond that, I think I'm probably going to be uh, hanging out at coffee shops, fixing up my coffee machine here, uh, maybe trying to you know get rid of some boxes uh from the moving process but good stuff cool general moving and packing things yep um i will be uh visiting both coasts in the month of august nice going to boston this coming weekend and uh what is that one two three weeks after that i will be in seattle for the first time there oh man Uh, you're gonna have so much fun i'm excited yep um yeah, Boston for a wedding and to see a friend and Seattle just for fun. Um, I will be seeing Pendulum. I will be voting in the primaries. Yeah. I will be seeing at least one fringe show. Uh, I will be attending JavaScript Minnesota for the, for the first time in three months. So Ayo. that's good. Um, I'll be super excited to uh, have somebody to, to uh, point to and give a shout out for. <laughs> um, that'll be fun stuff. Nice. Yeah. Very Looking good. forward to it. What about you, Ryan? Uh, I'm going to be working. That's really exciting stuff. I'm going to uh, also go on a very short vacation um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're going up to the um, Lake Superior area and hanging out. Nice. Awesome. It's always good to go somewhere in August when it's the hottest and um, most humid time of year. Mm. So um, you got, it's, it is <laughs> true Minnesotan weather. It mm. is. And, uh, and then I'll go to the fair in the same weather and uh, it'll be great. Yep. Yeah. Now, where can we find you on the internet, Brandon? Well, you can find me uh, various places, but mostly on Twitter, where I'm Brandon underscore and then. Uh, you can also occasionally find information about me on my website, which, uh, if you take my username and sub in the uh, a dot where the underscore is, uh, you'll get Brandon dot mn, which is where there's some information about who I am that is probably a little duplicative for listeners of this show. Hi, Ian. Um, <laughs> Uh, otherwise, uh, Brandon underscore MN is my name on basically every platform, uh, at least the ones that allow underscores and the ones that don't. Ask me on Twitter and I'll find you the rest of it. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, BrianM.me, where I recently put a new blog post up for the first time in a long time, but that Ayo. just links to my company's blog that I am a co author on. A Which is pretty there. cool. Hubot. Ooh. What about you, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryan Amar, and of course on my website, ryanrampersad.com, and also at events where I hand out my new business cards that look just like my website. Nice. They're pretty snazzy. Yes, they are. They're even nicer in person, to be honest. Haha, <laughs> right on. Nice. Yeah. Well, you can find show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash pk40. Uh, you can also find us on Reddit at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV, and we can have discussions there about the episode. Um, and as always, we have a Patreon now, which can be found at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Woohoo! Until next time, have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. <laughs>